Contradictions After showing how vile and how great man is, let man now judge his own worth, let him love himself, for there is within him a nature capable of good, but that is no reason for him to love the vileness within himself. Let him despise himself because this capacity remains unfilled, but that is no reason for him to despise this natural capacity. Let him both hate and love himself. He has within him the capacity for knowing truth and being happy, but he possesses no truth which is either abiding or satisfactory. I'll pause there and today's reading will start with the reading of, of the chapter. I'll add parts of the original French and I'll give you small commentaries as we ride along. Um, first of all, it strikes me that Blaise Pascal might even be referencing the possibility that uh, within Christianity there's been a tradition of estrangement, you could say, from the body. That bodily love or physical acknowledgements uh, may, may have been something distant from everyday consciousness, um, that the body becomes estranged from the person uh, within Western Christendom, for example. Uh, something that Bataille picks up on and perhaps is guilty of the first thing that Blaise Pascal references, loving the vileness within oneself. It's also curious that Blaise Pascal comments that there is no truth which man has which is either abiding or satisfactory. So one elemental truth to a man or to a person may stick but not for long, may fly, fly away um, easily. I should therefore like to arouse in man the desire to find truth, to be ready, free from passion, to follow it wherever he may find it, realising how far his knowledge is clouded by passions. I should like him to hate his concupiscence. So concupiscence is the so-called improper or illicit desire. So uh, lust, for example, concupiscence, you can just replace with the word lust. I would like to, where, where are we? Excuse me. I should like him to hate his concupiscence. There you go, this fear of the body, which automatically makes his decisions for him, so that it should not blind him when he makes his choice, not hin nor hinder him once he has chosen. We are so presumptuous that we should like to be known all over the world, even by people who will only come when we are no more. Such is our vanity that the good opinion of half a dozen of the people around us gives us pleasure and satisfaction. It's one of many of Blaise Pascal's warnings against the desire for fame or for even for recognition. It is dangerous to explain too clearly to man how like, how like he is to the animals without pointing out his greatness. It is also dangerous to make too much of his greatness without his vileness. It is still more dangerous to leave him in ignorance of both, but it is most valuable to represent both to him. I suspect that this is an impossible task to include within one concept, within one book, the huge contradiction of our greatness and potential, our lowness, our vileness, or as he put it in the last chapter, his re man's wretchedness, le, la misère, the misery of man. Is that a concept of such a strong duality that it's hard to even contain in the same breath, the same sort of sentence in your head? Man must not be allowed to believe that he is equal either to animals or to angels, nor to be unaware of either, but he must know both. Greatness and wretchedness. Since wretchedness and greatness can be concluded each from the other, some people have been more inclined to conclude that man is wretched for having used his greatness to prove it, while others have all the more cogently concluded he is great by basing their proof on wretchedness. Everything that could be said by one side as proof of greatness has only served as an argument for the others to conclude that he is wretched. Since the further one falls to the wretched, or the further one falls the more wretched one is, and vice versa. 
One has followed the other in an endless circle, for it is certain that as man's insight increases, so he finds both wretchedness and greatness within himself. In a word, man, is, man knows he is wretched. Thus, he is wretched because he is so, but he is truly great because he knows it. Isn't Blaise Pascal urging us to simply feel more, to acknowledge more, to expand consciousness? He calls us in the original French beasts and angels, aux bêtes et ni aux anges. Uh, il ne faut pas que l'homme croit, it's not, it shouldn't be that man believes he is equal to the angels or equal to the beasts. Il ne faut pas que l'homme croit qu'il est égal aux bêtes ni aux anges. And this interesting idea that it's, it's, it's possibly harder for us to conceive of our greatness when we're so surrounded by our, our knowledge of our, our lowness. Um, it's enough for us to know that we are great for us to uh, feel it. Thus he is wretched because he is so, but he is truly great because he knows it. Il est donc misérable puisqu'il est, mais il est bien grand puisqu'il le connaît. So there's a difference between uh, knowing one is wretched one and that one is great. Contradictions. Contempt for our existence. Dying for nothing. Hatred of our existence. Contradictions. Man is naturally credulous, incredulous, timid, bold. Again, we're pushing out those two, those two oppositions, those dualities that seem to transcend our everyday um, understanding of man. And we know Pensée was written um, and, and incomplete, unfinished. This is all we've got uh, to deal with. He died before he reached his 40s, having achieved so much. Yet we have to piece together wider meaning from this since we were given the pensée in note form. So here we have two sentences that I just read. They're just two sentences. Contempt for our existence, dying for nothing, hatred of our existence. Standing alone like a, a naked bare tree with no leaves in the winter. Then we have another sentence. Contradictions. Man is naturally credulous, incredulous, timid, bold. L'homme est naturellement quiet, crédule, incrédule, timide, téméraire. They push a bit closer to perhaps the, the uh, genre of, of aphorism, this standalone, semi mysterious sentences. We don't know perhaps if Blaise Pascal was going to continue to flesh out these notes. It seems to me at least we're in a position where all we can do is just do a, put, put more meat on the bone ourselves. And perhaps it suffices that there are the, just these sentences on their own, standing isolated for us to interpret and to pull meaning out of. Perhaps it's simply enough just to signpost the vileness and the greatness of humanity. It seems Pascal was also one of the first sociologists, the first people to really understand that it was culture that has such a strong pull on human behaviour. So he talks about artifice, he talks about habit. I'll continue reading. What are, what are our natural principles but habitual principles? In children, it is the principles received from the habits of their fathers, like hunting is the case in the case of animals. A change of habit will produce different natural principles, as can be seen from experience. And if there are some principles which habit cannot eradicate, there are others, both habitual and unnatural, which neither nature nor a new habit can eradicate. It all depends on one's disposition. Disposition is a word... It's quite interesting, historically, well, that means still today, uh, the tendency of mind. 
it, it, the, the habit of the mind, it, first of all, I don't know how many years ago, hundreds of years ago, used to just mean arrangement and the ordering of something, the managing of a particular thing, the disposition. Um, to pose something on a table, for example, to place something and then dis being away, around. So it's to be placed in many ways. Disposed, I am disposed to a drink or two. Uh, I am disposed to this or that. I have a tendency or an inclina inclination to this. It all depends on one's disposition. Fathers are afraid that their children's natural love may be eradicated. What then is this nature which is liable to be eradicated? Habit is a second nature that destroys the first. Habit is a second nature that destroys the first. La coutume est une seconde nature qui détruit la première. But what is nature? Why isn't habit not natural? I am very much afraid that nature itself is only a first habit, just as habit is a second nature. That recalls, of course, when we say, when we've learnt something that's really into our, you could say, our muscle memory, like driving a car, um, learning an instrument, that, yeah, yes, you could never forget it. You could never forget how to do it. So habit becomes second nature. Perhaps that's where we get the, the idea of second nature that it's something we have learnt so well that we don't need to think about doing it while we are executing it. The idea of flow, perhaps, within uh, sports uh, or music. I'm very much afraid that nature itself is only a first habit, just as habit is a second nature. So he's disputing, possibly, even the whole concept of nature, what it means to be a natural thing, given that it is so melted or enmeshed within second nature or habit. J'ai grand peur que cette nature ne soit elle-même qu'une qu première coutume, comme la coutume est une seconde nature. Man's nature may be considered in two ways, either according to his end, and then he is great and beyond compare, or according to the masses, as the nature of horses and dogs is judged by the masses from seeing how they run or ward off strangers. And then man is abject and vile. These are the two approaches which provoke such divergent views and such argument among philosophers, because each denies the other's hypothesis. One says, man was not born for this end, because everything he does belies it. The other says, he is falling far short of his end when he acts so basely. Two things teach man about his whole nature, instinct and experience. Trade, thoughts. Trade here in the original is métier. So métier uh, would be more like we associate that more with job, uh, my job, métier. But here in the English, it's trade. There's some interesting choices here in the original, in the uh, translation I have. Trade, thoughts. All is one, all is diversity. How many natures lie in human nature? Que de nature en celle de l'homme. That's a bit of a tricky uh, one to translate there. Uh, so they've been creative in the English one. Que de nature en celle de l'homme. Uh, how many natures in that which is the man or that which is mankind. Translated here as how many natures lie in human nature. Possibly one of those uh, sentences which is maybe even better in the English. How many occupations, how fortuitously in the ordinary way each of us takes up the one that he has heard others praise. 
a well turned heel a well turned heel just on itself talon bien tourné what a image for the idea of a changing nature and a diverse person a diverse series of dispositions a well turned heel un talon bien tourné I think proverbially, if you turn on your heels, what we might say today, more, more, more contemporarily, you flip-flop, you <laughs> change your policy if you're a politician. No bad thing, in my opinion. Talon bien tourné. We change our mind really quickly or we retract. And here it is. The memorable passage 130 in my English translation and 121 in the original French a standout passage for me regarding the contradictions of humanity the diverging arrows pointing different ways within one human within one individual here we go if he exalts himself I humble him. If he humbles himself, I exalt him. And I go on contradicting him until he understands that he is a monster that passes all understanding. Qu'il est un monstre incompréhensible. I think we can do a bit better with the translation there. Blaise Pascal wants to highlight, wants to chalk out or to define Definitively, the incomprehensible monster, that is, the man, to use the language of the time. I'm going to read it again with a translation. If he exalts himself, I humble him. If he humbles himself, I exalt him. S'il se vante, je l'abaisse. S'il s'abaisse, je le vante. And I go on contradicting him. Et le contredit toujours, until he understands that he is a monster that passes all understanding, that he is an incomprehensible monster. Jusqu'à ce qu'il comprenne qu'il est, qu est un monstre incompréhensible. Two words to really help our diving into. Les pensées, incomprehensible monster. The strongest of the skeptics, now skeptics um, are called in the French les Pironiens. Uh, Pironians, I'm guessing we could call them. We think of a Pyrrhic victory, a weak victory that damages the victor. Um, I suspect the skeptics are called skeptics in the original in the English and Pironien in the French because skeptics to English readers is probably a lot more uh, colourful as a phrase or more accurate and perhaps it's more widely understood as a, a idea of the the old early skeptics the, the the early Greek philosophers who discussed I'm no expert on this but uh, I think a central part of early skeptic skeptical thought wasn't as is today wasn't religion, it wasn't the existence of God necessarily, it was the existence of knowing anything, what we could call epistemology. So uh, we have this fantastically vivid passage on knowing, or how knowing that we know uh, dreams, which one is the reality, which one is, is uh, fiction. The strongest of the skeptics arguments to say nothing of the minor points is that we cannot be sure that these principles are true, faith and revelation apart. So uh, Blaise Pascal believes truest knowledge comes from faith and revelation, which makes him sound rather like a century ago, or a century before Blaise Pascal, Martin Luther. Uh, revelation alone and faith alone guides your spiritual conduct, to put it really simply. So not the priest, not Rome. We shouldn't forget that Blaise Pascal was a member, was a Jansenist or a Jansenist, Jansenist, 
um, which was a kind of um, Catholicism getting quite popular in his day. So that's around the 16, mid 1600s. And the Jansenism or Jansenism uh, was really looked and smelled a lot like Calvinism. So a very stark understanding of spiritual or spirituality and one that highlighted the individual connection to God rather than that of the congregation or the priest or, oh God forbid, the Pope. So, we can't be sure that these principles are true. That is the arguments of the skeptics. Faith and revelation apart except through some natural intuition. Now, this natural intuition affords no convincing proof that they are true. There is no certainty apart from faith as to whether man was created by a good God, an evil demon, or just by chance. And so it is a matter of doubt, excuse me, depending on our origin, whether these innate principles are true, false, or uncertain. Moreover, no one can be sure, apart from faith, whether he is sleeping or waking, because when we are asleep, we are just as firmly convinced that we are awake as we are now. Something wonderful that Sam Harris uh, said uh, about in any other respect, dreaming and sleeping is a permanent psychosis. Things happen in our sleep, as he says, things happen in our sleep, which are totally normal. We can do extraordinary things and it doesn't strike us for a second as being strange. This uh, isn't from any of his writing, this is from a podcast, which I'll leave the link to uh, in the video description on sleep. And this podcast is about three and a half hours long. Some quite extraordinary things happen in this territory where we spend more than a third of our lives, which in waking would be utterly impossible, utterly psychotic. So we're entering in sleep a permanent, you could say a permanent psychosis. It's a wonderful psychosis in my opinion. When we are asleep, we are just as firmly convinced that we are awake as we are now. As we often dream, we are dreaming, piling up one dream on another. It is not possible that this half of our life is itself just a dream onto which the others are grafted, and from which we shall awake when we die. That, while it lasts, we are as little in possession of the principles of truth and goodness as during normal sleep. All this passage of time, of life, all those different bodies which we feel, the different thoughts which stir within us, may be no more than illusions like the passage of time and vain phantoms of our dreams. I'd love to know what Virginia Woolf thought of dreams, given that she discussed so many times in her novels the multiplicity of the human psyche, the many selves that we inhabit from one day to the never, and not just that, from one hour to the next. Great reference point on this is Mrs. Dalloway. We think we are seeing space, shape, movement. We feel time pass, we measure it. In fact, we behave just as we do when we are awake. As a result, since half of our life is spent in sleep, on our own admission and despite appearances, we have no idea of the truth because all our intuitions are simply in illusions during that time. Who knows whether the other half of our lives, when we think we are awake, is not another sleep slightly different from the first, onto which our dreams are grafted as our sleep appears, and from which we awake when we think we are sleeping. And who can doubt that, if we dreamed in the company of others, and our dreams happen to agree, which is common enough, and if we were alone when awake, we should think things had been turned upside down. These are the main points on each side, to say nothing of minor arguments, like those the skeptics direct against the influences of habit, education, local customs, and so on, which a slightest puff of skepticism overturns, though they convince the majority of ordinary people who have only heard this vain basis for their dogmas. You have only to look at their books. If you're not sufficiently persuaded, you soon will be, perhaps, perhaps too much so. Again, he's talking about the old, uh, the, the skeptics. 
I pause at the dogmatist's only strong point, which is that we cannot doubt natural principles if we speak sincerely and in all good faith. To which the sceptics reply in a word that uncertainty as to our origin entails uncertainty as to our nature. The dogmatists have been trying to, re to answer that ever since the world began. Anyone wanting ampler information about scepticism should look at their books. He will soon be persuaded, perhaps too much so. This is again, this is some strange repetition that's gone on here in the, in the English copy where they've almost as if they've accidentally copy and pasted parts of the, parts of the original. Uh, it's always going to be a scrap uh, dealing with these fragments of Pascal. This means open war between men in which everyone is obliged to take sides, either with the dogmatists or with the sceptics, because anyone who imagines he can stay neutral is a sceptic par excellence. This neutrality is the essence of their clique. Anyone who is not against them is their staunch supporter, and that is where their advantage appears. They are so even for themselves, they are neutral, indifferent, suspending judgment on everything, including themselves. I don't think it's too exaggerated to say that the sceptics, Blaise Pascal discusses, sceptics from the 1600s and before, very much resemble postmodernists of today, the, those utterly sceptical, utterly uh, negating any uh, fundamental truth, relegating all understanding of humanity to relative truth, to truth that exists within communities. Therefore, the, dis the disability, in my opinion, or the inability to cast moral judgment results in the total um, undermining of any possible moral and philosophical work. So he points out that the whole project of skepticism is impossible. We just can't live without some kind of understanding of fundamental truth. He says, um, what then are we to do? What then? Is man to do in this state of affairs? Is he to doubt everything, to, to, to doubt whether he is awake, whether he is being pinched or burned? Is he to doubt, doubt whether he is doubting, to doubt whether he exists? No one can go that far. And I maintain that a perfectly genuine skeptic has never existed. Nature backs up helpless reason and stops it going so wildly astray. So natural intu intuition, the sensation of thought is, I suppose, back to Blaise Pascal suggesting, our only recourse to truth, or to what feels at least like truth. Uh, the, the, the original is quite nice here. Um, can I find it? I'll just read from my, what I've written. Uh, so he says, well, no, no genuine sceptic has ever existed. Uh, again, it's quite nice in the translation, the original. Il n'y a jamais eu, il n'y a jamais eu uh, de péronien effectivement parfait. Uh, it's never been a perfect sceptic. It just can't exist. Otherwise, it would sort of melt in a jumble of uh, overheated meanings. Nature backs up helpless reason and stops it going too wildly astray. It's a shame I can't find the original, but it's a... Uh... And he also says, how do we get out of this? How do we get out of this state of affairs? It's quite neutral in the English. Qui de mêlera cet embrouillement? That's a really hard word I struggle with. Uh, it comes from proi, proi. Oh, prier is like a draft of something. Um, a mix of fuzzy thoughts. And embrouillement is that sort of haziness, that um, sketchiness of, of man. And de mêlera, I, was, I suppose, means to untangle, de mêlera, uh, to un, unpick, unwind something. Yeah, il n'y a, a jamais eu de péronien effectif parfait. There's never been a perfect skeptic. Uh, do we doubt who we are? Doutera-t-il s'il y est? On, non peut, on ne peut pas venir là. Et je mets en fait qu'il n'y a jamais eu un premier effectif parfait. We can't go that way. We can't possibly uh, move for the, for the doubt existing within true scepticism. 
Okay. Is he, on the other hand, to say that he is the certain possessor of truth when at the slightest pressure he fails to prove his claim and is compelled to lose his grasp? What sort of freak, then, is man? How novel, how monstrous, how chaotic, how paradoxical, how prestigious, sorry, how prodigious. Judge of all things, feeble earthworm, repository of truth, sink of doubt and error, glory and refuse of the universe. Quelle chimère est-ce donc que l'homme? I mean, chimère. Uh, well, I can't really think of the. I think there's a similar word, something like chimère. Is that right? A ghost. That's what strikes me in the original. In in the, in the English, what freak? What sort of freak is man? Uh, what, how novel? How monstrous? How chaotic? How paradoxical? How prodigious? Quelle nouveauté? Quel monstre? Quel chaos? Quel sujet de contradiction, quel prodige. What a prodigious, what an ex excelling individual. I like the word prodigious, we don't really use it at all, but what a promising person, what, what kind of uh, amazing potential there is within humanity. Uh, judge of all things, juge de toutes choses, uh, feeble earthworm. Imbécile, vers de terre. So imbécile, imbécile, headed towards the earth. Dépositaire du vrai, repository of truth. Cloaque d'incertitude et d'erreur. Sink of doubt and error. Glory and refuse of the universe. Gloire et rebout de l'univers. Ou l'univers. Who will unravel such a tangle? This is certainly beyond dogmatism and scepticism, beyond all human philosophy. Man transcends man. L'homme passe l'homme. Let us then concede to the sceptics what they have so often proclaimed, that truth lies beyond our scope and is an unattainable quarry that is in that is that it is no earthly denizen, but at home in heaven, lying in the lap of God, to be known only in so far as it pleases him to reveal it. Let us learn our true nature from the uncreated and incarnate truth. Right, we don't know where truth is, definitely doesn't, doesn't exist within the human, so let's relegate it all to heaven. Of course, not using his words, that to me seems a little bit dismissive of the location of truth if it does exist at all it must exist somewhere blaise pascal sends it all up to heaven um curious 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 enter that paragraph let us learn our true nature from the uncreated and incarnate truth the word i will land upon uncreated ancré Apprenons, apprenons donc de la vérité ancrée et incarnée notre véritable nature. Uncreated. That to me suggests something uh, pure, entirely pure. If we seek truth through reason, we cannot avoid one of these three sects. You cannot be a skeptic or a platonist without stifling nature. You cannot be a dogmatist without turning your back on reason. Nature confounds the skeptics and platonists and platonists and reason confounds the dogmatists. What then will become of you, man, seeking to discover your true condition through natural reason? You cannot avoid one of these three sects nor survive in any of them. Know then, proud man, what a paradox you are to yourself. Connaissez donc, superbe, I like how he calls a proud man, just superbe, quel paradoxe vous êtes à vous-même. What a paradox you are to yourself. Know it, proud man. Be humble, impotent reason. Be silent, feeble nature. Learn that man infinitely transcends man. Hear from your master your true condition, which is unknown to you. Again, 
Be humble for impotent reason. Humiliez-vous, raison impuissante. Be silent, feeble nature. Taisez-vous, nature imbécile. Learn that man infinitely transcends man. Apprenez que l'homme passe infiniment l'homme. Hear from your master your excuse me. Hear from your master your true condition, which is unknown to you. Et entendez de votre maître votre condition véritable que vous ignorez. Listen to God. Écoutez Dieu. Is it not as clear as day that man's condition is dual? Dual. The point is that if man has had never really been corrupted, he would, in his innocence, confidently enjoy both truth and felicity. And if man had never been anything but corrupt, he would have no idea either of truth or bliss. But unhappy as we are, and we should be less so if there were no element of greatness in our condition, we have an idea of happiness, but we cannot attain it. We perceive an image of the truth and possess nothing of falsehood, nothing but falsehood. Being equally incapable of absolute ignorance and certain knowledge, so obvious is it that we have that we once enjoyed a degree of perfection from which we have unhappily fallen. So the explanation of why humans are so contradictory are so divergent within themselves from one day to the other and from one hour to the other, according to Blaise Pascal, is because we were once great, we were once close to God, and we fell. I think this isn't a bad idea. I think this isn't, uh, at least it's not a bad explanation. Original sin gets a bad press, but it is, at least symbolically, our falling from uh, grace, our desire for knowledge, our temptation. It is a, a rather handy, in a nutshell, explanation of why we can do such horrible things to each other. Blaise Pascal says we would be happier if we weren't, if we didn't have this capacity for greatness. It's not the other way around. Unhappy as we are, as he just said, and we should be less so if there were no element of greatness in our condition. We have an idea of happiness, but we cannot attain it. Nous avons une idée de bonheur et ne pouvons y arriver. Bonheur is a great word, very descriptive, literally. It really just means good, hour, bonheur, good time. But bonheur is very rich in meaning. Um, it rather escapes me, but bonheur is not just happiness, it's not really contentness, it's not exactly felicity, as uh, the English translation, translation has it. Bonheur seems to be like looking at a horizon and seeing the green and the, 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 the yellow and the, the orange of horizon. Happiness seems to me like a flash of yellow, and bonheur is like a line of happiness in the distance. We have an idea of happiness, but we cannot attain it. Nous avons une idée du bonheur et nous et ne pouvons y arriver. We perceive an image of the truth and possess nothing of falsehood. Excuse me, nothing but falsehood. We perceive an image of the truth and possess nothing but falsehood. Nous sentons une image de la vérité et ne possédons que le mensonge. Mensonge. We only possess lies. Incapable d'ignorer absolument et de savoir certainement, tant il est manifeste que nous avons été dans un degré de perfection de, dont nous sommes malheureusement déchus or fallen. So, we perceive an image of the truth and possess nothing but falsehood, being equally incapable of absolute ignorance. So, we're also unable to not know. <laughs> So it's a reversal of the sceptical acquiry, the idea of epistemology. How do we know that we know? Blaise Pascal is saying, why don't we know nothing? Why, are we, why do we have the ability to know something? 
being equally incapable of absolute ignorance and certain knowledge so obvious is it that we have that we once enjoyed a degree of perfection from which we have unhappily fallen what on earth could original sin teach us today how can we translate the old biblical idea of our fall from grace what does perfection mean in the archetypal man if you think about jung and what jung said about all these archetypes of of whatever of tradition uh, of of magicians and fools and the the tarot uh these roles that humans play what about this primeval one this original perf perfect man how many of our original religious traditions today come from this idea of fall from grace of an original perfected man um I like the idea, the Greek idea that we, the man and women, woman, were originally together, and they they were cracked down the middle, and hence, in so many languages, why we say for our partner, our husband, or wife, or girlfriend, or whatever, our my other half. What created that fissure? What cracked humans in the original place, in the in the original situation? Let us then conceive that man's condition is dual dual i found that word difficult dual 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 let us conceive that man infinitely transcends man and that without the aid of faith he would remain inconceivable to himself for who cannot see that unless we realize the duality of human nature we remain inv invincibly ignorant of the truth about ourselves man transcends man what does he really mean there that we're unable to understand ourselves or that we're greater than we could ever possibly conceive of ourselves if we were originally once perfect if we were perfect then why did we sin in the first place concevons donc que l'homme passe infiniment l'homme so uh, let us conceive then concevons donc that man's condition is dual let us conceive that man infinitely transcends man uh, et qu'il était inc inconcevable à soi-même is inconceivable that man is inconceivable to him or themselves and without sans le secours de la foi without the recourse to faith uh, we would still remain completely incomprehensible to ourselves so the revelation a direct inspiration or from from a transcendental or a higher being that is the only way we can contact nature uh, uh reality excuse me truth um let us conceive oh, we've done that then <laughs> it is however an astounding thing that the mystery furthest from our ken that of the transmission of sin should be something without which we can have no knowledge of ourselves Without doubt, nothing is more shocking to our reason than to say that the sin of the first man has implicated in its guilt men so far from the original sin that they seem incapable of sharing it. This flow of guilt does not seem merely impossible to us, but indeed most unjust. What could be more contrary to the rules of our miserable justice than the eternal damnation of a child, incapable of will, for an act in which he seems to have so little part that it was actually committed 6,000 years before he existed. Should forget, Blaise Pascal literally believed in the stories of the Old Testament. That wasn't a joke, that wasn't symbolic for him. We have to be comfortable with the fact that Blaise Pascal really believed those fables. 6,000 years ago, that's why he mentions, you know, this really happened 6,000 years ago, Adam and Eve. Certainly nothing jolts us more rudely than this doctrine, and yet, but for this mystery, the most incomprehensible of all, we remain incomprehensible to ourselves. The knot of our condition was twisted and turned in that abyss, so that it is harder con to conceive of man without this mystery than for man to conceive of it himself. Um, well there's there's a lot to go on here uh the the, the not i really like not as in k-n-o-t the not of our condition um so 
this is something I, I think we, we should just land on a little bit here. Le nerd, nerd, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, le nerd de notre condition, the knot of our condition, was twisted and turned in that abyss. C'est, um, le nerd de notre condition prend ses replis et ses tours dans cet abîme. Um, it's a nice uh, image of our incomprehensible self, that uh, of this one unified string twisted and turned upon itself. Certainly a very, very helpful image for therapy, in my opinion, for trauma is not a puncture in consciousness or in memory or in experience. Instead, the continuous self goes back and, and uh, into the past and f- into the future from this moment of trauma and b- binds into itself, with itself, of itself. Uh, therapy, therefore, is a process of unraveling the knot. We still remain the same string, and we contain that trauma within us. It never becomes a, a straight piece of string after the realization of trauma, like a sock, um, uh, a str- outstretched stock, sock, a sock that has been stretched, never quite gets back to the original firmness. Uh, or tightness, but it's still the same material. It's still the same sock. I also find it completely incomprehensible that we are the same person we were as teenagers and as children. That it's the same, in the sense, the same unity. But it's not because our cells are replace themselves. But we're still inhabiting that same space, the same vessel, uh, the same person that experiences the impressions that come into us. Does that make any sense? In a sense, we do completely change and ourselves re- replace themselves. I don't know how many, over how many years, but there is that paradox of change. How can change be possible? Um, I, I, I might be going slowly towards the idea of, of Zeno's paradox. I think it's X E N O. Change is impossible because how can one thing be in two places at the same time? The idea of a, an arrow traveling across a plane can't, it's, it's always still but changing reference. Hmm, I don't think I've explained that very well, but hopefully you get catch a bit of my drift there. At which point I've lost my spe- place. <laughs> so keep in mind that knot, that node, I think, uh, of, of existence, uh, the, the, the incomprehensibility of man. So, Blaise Pascal tries to explain why we are incompre- incomprehensible to ourselves. And he doesn't use many words to do this. Perhaps he never m- wanted to. Perhaps he died before he could have explained what he meant by the next passage. So instead of asking, how is it we know anything? Or how can we know anything? Blaise Pascal it seems to try to answer, why, why do we feel we know anything? Why do we feel we are made of of God's material? And why don't we just know nothing? Why can't we, why can't we not, why can't we just know nothing? And why do we have to be great or close to angels? Here's his explanation in a very short and rather mysterious passage. Everything that's come before, he says, shows that God, in his desire to make the difficulties of our existence unintelligible to us, hid the knot so high, excuse me, or more precisely, so low, that we were quite unable to reach it. I'm gonna read that again. (laughs) This shows, so the incomprehensibility of man and our knowledge of it and our knowledge of our greatness and of our vileness, this shows that God, in his desire to make the difficulties of our existence unintelligible to us, hid the knot so high, or more precisely, so low, that we were quite unable to reach it. Consequently, it is not through the proud activity of our reason, but through its simple submission that we can really know ourselves. This shows that God, in his desire to make difficulties of our existence unintelligible to us, d'où il paraît que Dieu voulant que nous rendre la difficulté de notre être unintellig- unintelligible, 
I've said that right. Unintelligible à nous-mêmes. On a caché le note si haut. He hit the knot so high. Ou pour mieux dire si bas. Or more precisely, so low. Que nous étions bien incapables d'y arriver. That we were quite incapable of reaching it. Or quite incapable to reach it. So the knot of our existence was placed, he really gives it a place so high in our greatness, or so low, more precisely, so low in that battalion, you could say that battalion depth of human wretchedness. <laughs> That's why I would say Blaise Pascal spends much more time talking about human wretchedness than human greatness. Maybe it feels more real. Lowness, negativity, pessimism, sadness, writes all those novels. How many of the world's classics are about felicity and bonheur and good times and sunny days? Really, really, really can't even be 10% of what is considered the canon of literature, Western literature, is actually about le, le bonheur or good times or, or happiness. It's all about the stuff of life, the soil, the depths of ourselves. Consequently, it is not through uh, the proud activity of reason, but through the simple, through its simple submission, that we can really know ourselves. So once we get out of rationality, out of logic, into pure experience, into direct connection with, to use uh, Blaise Pascal's term, with God, uh, that's how we know it. We are here on the ground, and we we know ourselves in relation to the our surroundings. Quand accord donc aux pyrrhoniens, ça so we'll veut agree with the sceptics, ce qu'ils ils ont donc crié, que la vérité n'est pas de notre portée ni de notre gibier. So, truth is beyond our scope and beyond our reason. It's, it's not our prey, it's not our game. Um... The, the, the translations don't really correspond here, and this often happens in the chapters where, uh, say, the English translation will skip a few uh, sentences or will do some funny business, making my life a little bit difficult. So I'll continue with the English. Those fundamental facts, solidly established, solidly established on the inviolable authority of religion, teach us that there are in faith two equally constant truths. One is that man is... is one is that man in the state of his emotions or in the state of grace is exalted above the whole of nature made like unto god and sharing in his divinity the other is is that in the state of corruption and sin he has fallen from that first state and has become like the beasts the two propositions are equally firm and certain does blaise pascal say that they are actually contradictory contradiction literally speaking against itself contra against Dictionary, diction, speaking, speaking against. Uh, and it's not even contradiction in the original French, it's contrariété, which is a slightly different etymology and I think purely boils down to um, opposition, contre, uh, counter. Scripture openly declares this when it says in certain places, now I'm going to read a long, quite a long list of biblical passages, all of which I believe are from the Psalms. My delights were with the sons of men. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Ye are gods, while saying in others, all flesh is grass. Man is like the beasts that perish. I said in my heart concerning the, the, the estate of the sons of men. It seems relevant to mention that the Psalms are worth reading. There's lots of them. I think they're supposed to be written by King Solomon, if I'm not mistaken. And they, uh, this seems really a basic point to make about a biblical a chapter of the Bible. But the Psalms really are didactic. They, they, it really is a case of someone just trying to get across a moral lesson, not get across, to force it upon the reader. There's not much swaying with the Psalms in many of them. There's rather beautiful reference to our baseness in the Psalms. Uh, man, not man is like the beast that perish, that's horrible. All flesh is grass. Can't but help, uh, it doesn't stop me from thinking of Walt Whitman leaves of grass that we sway with the with nature that 
Grass is a token of ourself, as Walt Whitman writes in his Song of Myself. Whence or from which, from all these biblical passages, it is clearly evident that man through grace is made like unto God and shares his divinity, and without grace he is treated like the beasts in the field. Like, without grace he is treated like the beasts in the field. Doesn't that possibly tell you why humans are so beastly to animals? Why so many of our uh, insults are about being an animal? The, the, the house is like, uh, um, excuse me, uh, this is like a pig's den, for example, or you behave like a snake, or y y I worked like a horse, or uh, he, he was killed like a dog. Um, it's funny how little we think of animals in our ordinary vocabulary. We don't even think twice about it. And perhaps originally, the Christian conception of our, or a Christian conception, one possible interpretation from the Bible, is that we are given dominion over the beasts. Certainly in French, uh, les bêtes, the beasts, uh, it's, it's very common in slang, embêté. Embêter is to annoy, to annoy someone. Uh, bêtise, bêtise is like beastness, beastness in a sense, and it means like nonsense, nonsense. So, we finished. Thank you for watching, I hope that was useful. And I hope to be cracking on with the rest of Les Pensées as soon as I get the time. If you would like to uh, keep following my work, uh, you can log on to buymeacoffee.com and you might even, if you have a couple of uh, euros or pounds or dollars to spare every month, could support me so I can spend more time with my heroes like Blaise Pascal, Hoping to work on a series about the genealogy of morals by Frederick Nietzsche or Friedrich Nietzsche here. And maybe we can do more chapters on the tarot. Thanks for listening and for watching.